If you got your Bibles, you might turn to John chapter 18. That's where we're going to be. And uh, this is a, a special series. I said that if you're ever going to invite your friends or family, this would be the time. Because you never know what Tony might say, so you might be nervous about who you invite. But all we're going to talk about from John chapter 18 all the way to John 21 is Jesus, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And we're going to try to do this from an apologetics standpoint, which means we're going to try to prove that these things are real, that it's not just something that we think, it's something that the whole world should think. Uh, last week, uh, I talked about uh, fact or fiction, and I mentioned that I had a friend uh, that said, well, uh, you can't prove Jesus was real because you can't prove a myth. And so some people are just not convinced that this is a factual, um, provable theory. And so we looked at fact or fiction, and last week, uh, how John's gospel is an eyewitness account which should change how we read it, knowing that it's an eyewitness account. It'd be just about like if we were in a courtroom and somebody handed you a handwritten sworn statement that they were an eyewitness to an accident. That's how we approach the text, the same way we would treat that uh, piece of uh, legal document. So fact or fiction, um, <clears throat> that this was an eyewitness testimony. Today... We're going to look at a portion of John 18, and really what it's going to paint is the person of Jesus. One of the other aspects of Jesus that people say is if they'll agree that he was real, that they'll say that he was just either a good prophet or he was some kind of a cult leader, and in some cases even a revolutionary, somebody that just wanted to come and change the landscape. Uh, but we want to look at this, was he a revolutionary or was he the Son of God? And I think that that's what our text today is going to spell out for us. So let's look at John chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> John 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. And so Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing there with them. And when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. And so he asked them again, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken, that of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. That's going to be the key of our text today. I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? We'll go on to verse 12. And so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and had him bound. This is the last bit of text that we're going to read before Jesus' trial begins. And from there, it goes on to his crucifixion. And yet, you know, there seems a, just a bit of passing information, but there's so much here and the way I want to structure the sermon today is I want to make sure that the picture gets painted for the person of Jesus. What does this particular section of text tell us about Jesus and his overall plan and the way he carried out his mission while he was on earth? So we want to look at verse 1, but what I'd like to do is there's so many of the Greek words here that, that paint the picture uh, what I'd like to do is go back through a few of the verses. If you've got your Bibles, you look at your uh, translation. But
But I want to translate this right straight from the, the Greek, and you can kind of see how that matches up with your translation, because there's some things that really uh, need to be caught here. So if we start out in verse 1, <clears throat> uh, this said Jesus, going with uh, the disciples of him, uh, crossing Chemaru, the Chemaru, that's an important word, and it's translated brook, crossing a brook, the brook of the Kidron, uh, where there was Kaipos, there was a garden, and into which Ace Hong, that's going to be unique, that's uh, Ace is talking about going into something. So uh, we're going to get something from that as well uh, with his disciples of him. So real quick, a little bit of geography that we want about Jerusalem, because this idea of crossing over the Kidron, that tells us so much about how to interpret the person of Jesus. So I want to bring that out to you. Um, imagine Jerusalem. You know Jerusalem was a city on a hill. So let's imagine Jerusalem is kind of like being on top of Mount Badger, right? We got any people that hike Mount Badger? I wouldn't do it either if I would. But anyway, yeah. So hiking Mount Badger. So Jerusalem is on, on Badger. As soon as you go out the walls of Jerusalem, you've got to start walking downhill because it's up on a hill. So you walk down a hill, and as soon as you walk down a hill, in order to walk up the next hill, what do we call that little area in between there? It's a valley, right? That's called the Valley Kidron, the Kidron Valley. So you'd walk out of Jerusalem, down a hill, across the Kidron Valley, up the next hill, and the next hill was the Mount of Olives. We know Jesus went there a lot to pray and to talk with his apostles. Well, if you keep walking up the Mount of Olives, you walk around the back and then down that hill, and in two miles, you come to a town called Bethany. Bethany is where Lazarus was raised from the dead. Bethany is where Jesus would go all the time when he wanted to leave Jerusalem. He would go to Bethany to hang out with friends that he had there, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And then if you kept going downhill from Bethany, you would descend about 2,000 feet, and you'd end up in 15 miles, you end up in Jericho. Okay? So that's the landscape there. And this little valley, uh, the word there is Chemaru, which is translated a brook. But what's interesting about Chemaru is it's two words. Ru means flowing. Chemaru means winter. So this Kedron Valley is dry all year long, except for in the winter rainy season. We know what our Octobers and Novembers look like around here. It gets dark, wet, cold, and rainy. And so the fact that John is letting us know that the brook was there, we know that it was wintertime, we know that it was cold, and we know that it had been a lot of rain because there was water flowing. So that's some, John is the only gospel that gives us that bit of information. Remember, John was an eyewitness, so that's interesting. So it's winter, it's cold, and there was a brook running, so that means that they had had a lot of rain. <clears throat> The next interesting thing is about the garden. Uh, across from this brook and before you actually go up the hill, because going up the hill puts you on the Mount of Olives. But once you cross the brook at the foot of the hill, apparently there was a garden. And uh, my understanding is in Israel, they wouldn't allow people to have gardens in Jerusalem, that only the wealthy people could have them outside the city of Jerusalem because it was unsacred to bring dung and fertilizer into the city. So people had to have their own private gardens outside the city. So this was a, a little private garden, and we want to believe that it was actually walled in and that there was a gate to get into it because the word ace hong, into which him and his disciples went. So we kind of believe that this is a, a, a gated, walled off area. That's going to be important in just a little bit. Uh, the whole history of the Valley of the Kidron, uh, that should have told us something significant when it said that they crossed over the Kidron. But it doesn't because we don't know anything about the area. So I want to just give you a little bit of a history about what that was. Uh, the first one we see is during Josiah's reforms, while Josiah is reforming Jerusalem, uh, he comes at a time when there was a bunch of idols and a bunch of pagan worship happening inside of Jerusalem. And during his reforms, he breaks down all those idols, all those high places, and we want to know what did he do with all the rubble that was in Jerusalem, okay? So in 2 Kings chapter 23, 
We're told, and the king commanded Hilkiah, the priests, the second order, and the keepers of the threshold to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and Asherah and for the hosts of the heavens, meaning those dedicated to the stars. And he burned them outside of Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron. I'm going to great lengths just to kind of help you understand something very simple. He burned these things outside of Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron. One other uh, example, when Solomon uh, took over, there were some people that tried to rebel and take the kingdom, the kingship away from him, some people that had treated his dad poorly. And so Solomon told the people, I'm going to spare your life because you didn't kill my father, but I am angry with you and here's the rule. I don't want you leaving Jerusalem. And notice what the boundary line was for these people, okay? I don't want you leaving Jerusalem. The king summoned Shimei and said to him, build a house for yourself in Jerusalem and live there, but do not go anywhere else. On the day that you cross the Kidron Valley, there's our word, the day that you cross the Kidron Valley, know for sure that you will die. So what I want us to understand is from the Jewish perspective, the Kidron Valley meant you were leaving the city, right? When they wanted to destroy the idols and get rid of them, he said, take them over to the Kidron Valley because we want to get them out of the city. When he told certain people that I'll allow you to live, I'll spare your life, but if you ever leave the city, I'll kill you if you ever cross the Kidron. Uh, the last one that's of interest is when God called Jerusalem sacred, that city on the hill, he gave them the boundary line for what part was considered sacred. Sacred, Jeremiah 31 and 40. All the fields as far as the brook of the Kidron. And then to the corner of the house, the horse gate towards the east shall be sacred to the Lord. It shall be sacred unto the Lord. So that's our background. Now we're like the Israelites. So when somebody says... They went out of Jerusalem and crossed the Kidron Valley. Our understanding is they left the city. Okay, They were outside of the city. Now, what's going to be interesting is why would Jesus, at a time like this, make sure he was outside of the city? In verse 2, verse 2, but knowing also Judas... And then Judas is given a title here. It has an article in front of it. The betrayer. I think some translations say the one who betrayed Christ. But in the Greek, Judas is given a name with an article. The betrayer. He himself also knew this place. He knew right where the garden was because, and this is interesting, much gathering Jesus there with the disciples. I love the way that reads in the Greek. Much gathering they did there with the disciples. So Judas knew the place where Jesus was because he had taken his disciples there many times. It was familiar. That's another key to all of uh, looking at the person of Jesus. What's interesting in this verse <clears throat> In verse 4, it says, Jesus, knowing all that would happen, knowing all that was about to take place. So a mob is going to come to take Jesus, and we're going to learn a little bit more about that mob too that only John tells us about. A mob is going to come take Jesus, um, and you know that there's going to be a possible confrontation. It was the Passover in Jerusalem at that time. It was the Passover. That's something else important to remember. At midnight, they would open the gates of the temple to begin the festivities. Sounds kind of crazy to us, right? In, in Europe, that's not such a crazy idea. Midnight, they would open the gates of the temple. Now, what's important is uh, Jerusalem, that city on a hill, had a population of about 600,000 people. That's about the same size as Seattle. But during the Passover... They have recorded how many sacrifices they made during the Passover, and they can tell from the number of sacrifices how many families were in Jerusalem, and they say that at the Passover, a million people came to visit Jerusalem during the Passover. So what we have right now at this time, you've got a, a Jerusalem is about the size of Rhode Island, 
I don't know if that helps anybody at all. It didn't help me, but it's the smallest city in the United States. So it's about the size of Rhode Island. What's interesting is Rhode Island has a population of one million people. So if we take Rhode Island, the population of one million people, and then add all the population of Seattle to Rhode Island, that's how busy Jerusalem was. That's important to know. Because when we realize that Jerusalem was jam-packed full of visitors, it was over capacity. When we realize this and that there was festivities going on, and Jesus chooses to go outside the city where there's no people, knowing full well that the mob was coming, to take him, that begins to tell us a little bit something about what Jesus was doing. Based on your understanding of, of evil, when they talk about maybe he was just a revolutionary, well, revolutionaries are like Fidel Castro and uh, Osama bin Laden. When they say that maybe he was just a zealot and he wanted to change things for uh, Jerusalem, uh, we're going to read about what a couple of zealots did in his time. <clears throat> but when you look at these people and you start thinking, if Osama bin Laden or uh, Saddam Hussein knew that a mob of people were coming to kill him, would he leave a city where he could have taken cover with a lot of uh, people being all around and go outside the city to a private garden where nobody was and his enemy knew exactly where to find him. Does that begin to paint a picture? When you know what evil people are like, would they have stayed in the city and taken people down with them? Or would they go out so that nobody else would get hurt? That's the picture that we're getting here. Uh, as we read on down, um, uh, Judas, having received the soldiers... Judas having received the, the speirang. Now the translation, your translation, where is that about verse? Yeah, verse 3. I'm going to tell you just what the Greek says and you can look at your, your, your version there. Judas having received the speirang. Now the speirang was a Roman cohort. And this is important. Your Bible probably has it translated a group of soldiers. But the Speron was a Roman cohort. A Roman cohort is 600 soldiers. 600 soldiers. John's gospel is the only gospel that tells us that there was a Roman cohort there. That's an interesting eyewitness account of John's. So I think the translation, a band of soldiers, doesn't quite do it justice. We're going to look at that a little closer. A Roman cohort, a Speron, um, uh, and those from the chief priests and some from the Pharisees, officials came there with uh, torches, lamps, and weapons. So the Spadron is a Roman cohort, 600 soldiers. There were six centurions in a cohort, in a Spadron. Six centurions, each one governing 100 people each. A little bit later on, when we get to verse 12, verse 12 says, Therefore, the Speron, the cohort, and the Hiliarchos, which is the commander of a cohort. So the picture here, oh, do I have a picture? There we go. That would be our picture of what's happening right now. Judas comes into the garden knowing Jesus was there with this Roman cohort, officers from the Pharisees, officers from the chief priests. And what these guys are, this is mob control. Can you imagine having a million visitors in your city and you know Rome was on high alert? Rome had extra resources because during Passover, that would be the worst time for something to go wrong. And here's this guy named Jesus that they're accusing of starting an insurrection. So Rome is prepared for this, and this is how they go out to see Jesus. Mob control is what they're imagining. The potential for violence is what I want to paint. This picture, the potential for violence is huge at this point in time right now, okay? I want to give you an example of where we see this mob control, the, uh, the spadrang with the official. 
There was a time when uh, Paul had returned from a missionary journey. He was coming back into Jerusalem. I believe it was his third missionary journey. <clears throat> Paul is coming back and the whole world is angry at Paul. The Jews are angry at Paul because he has been telling them, you don't have to obey the law of Moses anymore. You don't have to sacrifice. I mean, you don't have to circumcise your children anymore. And by this time, there is a huge uproar about Paul. He's leaving Ephesus and he says, I'm concerned because the Spirit has warned me that I'm going to be taken prisoner when I get to Jerusalem. So Paul gets to Jerusalem and the, the elders in Jerusalem say, Paul, there's a bit of a problem. We need you to do some purifying for a week. We need you to pay some fees and we need you to look contrite because all the Jews here in Jerusalem are angry at you. Paul enters into the temple and when he enters into the temple is when all the Jews come together and try to pounce on him. So you've got a single man that people are trying to pounce on. And we see this in Acts chapter 21 and verse 30. The whole city was stirred up and the people ran together and they seized Paul. They drug him out of the temple at once. The gates were shut and they were seeking to kill him when word came to the... <clears throat> When word came to the Heliarchos, that is the commander of the cohort, the word is translated tribune. The commander of, and then the word cohort here is our word that John gave us. <clears throat> the same word that John gave us. Uh, the Jerusalem was in confusion. So he at once took the soldiers and the centurions, probably six centurions per uh, cohort, they ran down to him when they saw the tribune and when they saw the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So this group, this small army is what Rome used as mob control, as riot control. If you can see that here. No other gospel uh, shows us this massive display of force. And what I think John is painting a picture of is the difference, whatever John's audience was, at this point in time that he's writing his gospel. There was some doubt about Jesus and who he was, the person of who he was. Was he just a false messiah? Was he just a revolutionary? And it's interesting that John paints this picture of Jesus for his audience so that they can tell the difference between a fake and the real thing. Remember when John paints the picture of the good shepherd versus the bad shepherd in John chapter 10 and verse 10. Here's the difference. Here's how you're going to know the difference. A thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus came so that they could have life and to have it in its fullness. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now think of the bin Ladens and the Saddam Hussein's, did they go out and sacrifice themselves for their people? That's what a revolutionary looks like. The hired hand, the fake one, the guy that's not really a shepherd, the sheep are not really his own. When he sees trouble coming, he runs. He abandons the sheep. And then the wolf pounces on them and scatters the flock. John is painting a vivid picture of what the true Messiah would look like and a false Messiah. And that's the same picture we're painting because the same divisions about Jesus exist today, whether or not he was real or just a, an uprising. <clears throat> John has used so far through his gospel, John has used testimony to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. Remember, John the Baptist testified that Jesus was the Messiah. John has used the miraculous, starting with uh, Jesus turning hundreds of gallons of water into wine. John has used the miraculous to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. John has used Jesus' teachings as authoritative. Do you remember when they said no one has ever taught like this man his authority to prove that he was the Messiah? John has used the fulfillment of prophecy when Jesus shows up at the Feast of Booths the way they were commanded to keep the Feast of Booths, when Jesus said, I am that bread that came down out of heaven. <clears throat> Jesus has used the fulfillment, I mean, uh, John, the fulfillment of prophecy to prove Jesus is the Messiah. John has used sovereignty. 
Jesus kept saying, my time has not come yet. My time has not come yet. They picked up rocks to stone him, but they couldn't take him because my time has not come yet. So John has painted the picture of sovereignty to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. And now John at the very end here is painting the person of Jesus, who he was, to paint that picture of him being the good shepherd. <clears throat> we have a couple of examples. Um, in Acts chapter 5, we're told what it looks like when false messiahs have risen up in the past. And then Josephus actually uh, validates this, but uh, in Acts chapter 5, the Pharisees are, somebody is giving some advice to the Pharisees saying, hey, look, this has happened before. False prophets have risen before. False messiahs have come up before. And let's just remember what usually happens when a false guy shows up. Uh, here in Acts chapter 5 and verse 36. Some time ago, Thutius rose up claiming to be somebody. About 400 men joined him. He was killed and his followers were dispersed. And it all came to nothing. And after this, Judas the Galilean appeared. And he drew people away after himself, but he too perished. And all of his <clears throat> followers were scattered. What's interesting is that Ju Josephus, the Roman historian, records the same events that were mentioned in Acts chapter 5. Josephus says that Thudius was a self-proclaimed prophet that deluded the majority of the masses. <clears throat> The attack of a Roman cavalry. And we can kind of see the similarity here, the Roman cohort in Jesus' case. In Thudius, a Roman cavalry attacks. He brought an end to the uprising. Many of the movement were either slain or captured. And the picture I want to paint is that when somebody false shows up to make a movement, there's a lot of casualties. There's a lot of casualties. <clears throat> Another revolt uh, ben Shapiro, if you guys remember Ben Shapiro that I mentioned last week, he's a popular political correspondent. He is a proclaimed uh, Jewish Orthodox Jew. Orthodox means a very a, a practicing Jew. I actually do what Jews are supposed to do. And Ben Shapiro, as well-spoken and as well-educated as he is, he said that Jesus, that the, the Jewish view of Jesus is that Jesus was a good Orthodox Jew, but he tried to revolt against Rome. And so Rome killed him. That's what the Jews believe about Jesus. Jesus tried to revolt against Rome. So I wanted to show you what a revolt looks like. And let's ask ourselves, Jesus, was he a, did he do a revolt or was he the son of God? Let's look at the, the difference. The Maccabean revolt of 165. <clears throat> so when Antiochus Epiphanes was trying to, to, to Hellenize the Jews, and here is an account of that in 2 Maccabees. When these things were reported to the king, he thought that Judea was in a revolt, raging like a wild animal. He set out from Egypt, took Jerusalem by storm. He ordered his soldiers to cut down without mercy those that they met and to slay anyone who took refuge in their houses. There was a massacre of young and old, a killing of women and children, a slaughter of virgins and infants. In the space of three, in the space of three days, 80,000 people were slaughtered. That's what a revolt looks like. Does Jesus fit into that category at all? One other revolt, the Jewish War of 66, lasted three years, four years, 66 to 70. The Jewish revolt happened here. Josephus reported over one million people dead. The revolt lasted years, and it ended in the famous Masada. You guys remember the name Masada, at least the movie Masada? Things got so bad during that revolt that a woman was recorded as having boiled her baby in order to have something to eat. And another family boiled the thongs of their sandals to have soup to eat. That's how bad. That's what a revolt looks like. You can think of other examples. The David Koresh's of the world, the Jim Joneses of the world. <clears throat> All of those ended violently, right? All of those ended up in casualties and fatalities. 
But John is painting a different picture of Jesus to distinguish between the false messiahs, the false shepherds, and the true one. And John gave us this in Luke. Sorry, this account is Luke's. Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. After Jesus had sent out the 72 to evangelize while they were in Galilee, they returned to him with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nothing shall hurt you. That's the picture that John is painting for us of Jesus is the person of Jesus had the power to protect his sheep till the very end. I have lost none. There were no casualties. I think this is my, my last slide. In verse 12, therefore the spadra, this Roman cohort, 600 soldiers, <clears throat> and the Heliarchos, the commander of these soldiers, along with the officers of the Jews, they took Jesus and they bound him. And that's the end of our story for today. But the picture that gets painted, Jesus, a revolutionary? It's not possible because we've seen the destruction that happens when people tried to have a revolt. Jesus, a false Messiah? Impossible because we've seen the destruction that happened when people were false prophets and they tried to lead people astray. Jesus, some kind of a zealot that wanted to stop an uprising, an insurrection? Well, we see in Masada and we see in... Uh, the revolt of the Maccabees, what kind of devastation happens when these types of people try to lead a revolt? And I thought this was like a wartime scene. I want to conclude with, I called a buddy of mine that's in the military, and I explained to him what I see in this text. And what I see is Jesus coming on a mission, Jesus having completed the mission, and I said, when you go out on a mission and you come back, and you tell, you report to uh, the higher-ups about your mission, what's that language look like? What is it, how do you describe stuff? And he said, well, first of all, Tony, what you're talking about is an after-actions report. We call it the AAR. And in the after-actions report, we would say something like, mission accomplished, there were X number of friendly casualties. Friendly means your own guys got hurt, casualties. X number of friendly um, fatalities means so many of your own got killed. And then we would report the, the fatalities and the um, casualties of innocent people that were laying around. So that's how we would re re report our mission. And, and you know, that's really what I wanted to build up here in this text Here's Jesus' own after actions report. I came from heaven. I completed the work that the Father gave me to do. Peter, put away that sword. My kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. But they didn't. In another place, Matthew chapter 26, am I leading a rebellion that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Jesus himself says, I'm not trying to lead a rebellion. John 18 and 9, I have lost none of those you gave me. As Jesus gives his report back to God, he says, zero casualties, zero fatalities, because I protected the ones that you gave me. I have loved them until the very end, John chapter 13. And now I must certainly drink the cup that the Father has given me, and just the fact that Jesus goes outside of the city, not only was he preventing his own from being harmed, but he was preventing anybody inside the city from being harmed as well. That's not the picture of a cult leader. That's not the picture of a David Koresh or a Jim Jones, right? It's not the picture of a revolutionary. 
So when we're asking the question today from what John, the information that John has given us, Jesus revolutionary or son of God? Hopefully the evidence is overwhelming that it makes it obvious for us. I think that that's what John is trying to point out. You know, it's interesting for Jesus to have led the biggest change to ever affect mankind. Jesus' plan was that nobody gets hurt. Nobody in Jerusalem, none of my disciples, just me. I'm going to lay down my life. Jesus' plan was that nobody should get hurt. No other revolutionary in the world has ever been able to accomplish that. And then Peter steps up and just about messes up Jesus' plan. Do you see that? I think this is the first time I've ever gotten a good picture of why Pete, Jesus got so angry with Peter. is because Jesus had held his plan together. Zero fatalities, zero casualties. That was the report that he wanted to give his father. I used to think that he was mad at Peter because Peter was trying to stop him from being crucified. But one guy, what's one guy going to do against a Roman cohort of 600 soldiers? But right now, for the first time, I realized Jesus is after action report, his AAR. He knew from the beginning, no casualties, no fatalities. And that's how the world is going to know the difference between the true shepherd and the false ones. Well, Peter steps up and almost ruins it, doesn't he? Cuts the guy's ear off, right? Cuts the guy's ear off, so now you have a casualty. But Jesus heals it, right? So I guess we can erase that one casualty because Jesus fixed it. Jesus, a revolutionary or a messiah, the evidence is overwhelming as to which one it has to be. All right, let's pray and I'll uh, cut you loose here. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today's message. Father, it has been impact me so uh, sincerely. Father, the accomplishments of our Messiah and Savior, and Father, that the thing that distinguishes him, at least in our text today, Father God, is that he gave up his own life and made sure that nobody else would hurt in the process. Father, we've seen a bunch of cult leaders. We've seen a bunch of revolutionaries. We've seen a bunch of false messiahs. And they always end badly. And so, Father, I pray that you would impress on our hearts and open our eyes to the unfathomable possibility that Jesus could have accomplished his work on earth without a single fatality, without a single casualty. It shows us, Father, your sovereignty, your control over evil, and that evil could not have its way until you gave it its hour, that it would be allowed to have power for a moment. We'll look at that as we go towards the trial and the crucifixion. Father, we are amazed at how you've proved yourself to your people. Pray that you open the eyes of our hearts that we could see that in all its glory and impress on us your majesty, your sovereignty, and your love for mankind that Jesus would accomplish his mission without anyone getting hurt. In Christ's name we pray, amen.